All right. So for me, um, I was always a person that really enjoyed science. Like I love talking about science and thinking about science and planning experiments. Um, but, you know, early on in my, my research career, I knew I wasn't going to be uh, the type of person that spent my entire life at the bench. So and I, I looked at a lot of different opportunities and, and where I landed was patent law. So I want to take you a little bit through that journey. Um, first of all, I'm from Minnesota. So I don't know if there's any other Midwesterners in the crowd out there. There's not a ton of us out here on the East Coast, but um, grew up in the suburbs of Minneapolis. Uh, loved being there, but uh, decided I needed to get away for school. Uh, so I went to the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign and studied biochemistry there. And my intent was to go to medical school. Uh, I was really very excited about possibly becoming a doctor. And so I studied biochem and thought about med school and and, you know, uh, the summer after my sophomore year at Illinois, um, I had an opportunity to intern um, at Abbott Laboratories, which is now split into AbV and Abbott. But um, uh, that was a really interesting opportunity. It was the first time I had really done full-on lab research. And so I was working in a group that was looking at making um, oncology drugs uh, in the field of angiogenesis. So basically trying to stop blood vessels from going to tumors and feed them as a, as a mechanism of um, treating cancer. I thought it was super interesting. I worked in a chemistry lab my first summer and then ended up spending two more summers there um, in a biology group, um, sort of like testing clinical candidates. And that was super interesting. And so plans shifted a little bit. Um, so I went from being you know, interested in going to med school to you know, maybe having a career in research. So again, the winding road. Um, so then I, I stayed local in Illinois and I uh, moved on to Northwestern University um, to the, the PhD program there and was in a lab um, that was looking at basically uh, fold, uh, folding and unfolding of proteins by molecular machines. So it was a, sort of a biochem molecular biology spin. Um, a lot of the folks in our lab were working on mitochondrial import. So basically how the mitochondria unwinds uh, proteins. I looked at uh, proteasome degradation. So in order for the proteasome to degrade proteins, it has to be unfolded and pulled into the, uh, the, the deg degradation machinery. Um, so I tied that to uh, uh, a disease space when I looked at how basically um, folks with uh, neurodegenerative diseases, such as Huntington's or Alzheimer's, those proteins don't get degraded by the proteasome. So I looked at uh, how different protein repeats had an effect on the proteasome and made all sorts of cool protein motifs and did some really interesting research. Uh, but sort of every day uh, I sat at the lab bench, I started to realize that this wasn't gonna be for me um, career-wise. So I looked at uh, going into medical writing, I interviewed with several consulting firms, um, just had a lot of opportunities in that space, uh, but you know, none of those things were gonna be close enough to the science for me. So there was one woman in my lab, or not in my lab, but in a, in a lab that was close to us that had gone into patent law. And she came back one time and I was just having a chat with her over drinks and she said, hey, you know what? You should probably think about checking this out. I think this would be something that you would really appreciate, something that you, you know, that will continue to give you access to science, but you wanted to do the lab. So I looked at jobs and ended up getting hired by a law firm um, in Chicago called MBHB and um, worked there for a while, started off as what's called a technical specialist. So did a lot of um, reviewing of scientific literature, um, started drafting a few patent applications, and then, uh, and then I went on to take the patent bar. So patent law, unlike other types of law, you can actually practice without being an attorney. Um, you can't do courtroom work. You can't do legal opinions. Um, you can't really like advise clients, but you can practice before the patent and trademark office. So you can draft patent applications. You can what's called prosecute patents. So you can argue to get patents granted. Um, and so I did that for a few years, well, for like a year. And then after that point, I decided, you know, if I really want this to be my career, um, you know, I should probably go to law school. So um, I had the, uh, you know, best and worst time of my life uh, going to law school at night um, at Chicago Kent College of Law. I uh, did that for about three and a half years while practicing as a patent agent at MBHB. Um, and so that to me ended up being, I think, you know, a pretty good decision um, because I got to continue to get better at being a patent attorney um, while, you know, still going to school. I didn't have to take the break. 
So after I finished, um, then I went back to MBHB and uh, stayed on there, represented various clients, um, Sanofi, Amgen, BMS. Uh, interestingly, Penn State was one of our clients, um, a few other universities and got some really good experience doing patent law. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what that means a little bit more in the talk, but you know, doing patent law and, um, and, and getting an opportunity to interact with clients, but still it, was, it felt like um, I was too far away from the science. Uh, you know, because when you're at a law firm, you get a lot of interesting projects and they say, hey, you know, think about this disclosure. How would we get patent claims for this, et cetera? And then it goes back to the, to the company and like seemingly goes into a black box. I mean, you really have no idea how important that research is. Is it something that's critical to the pipeline of the company? Um, there's not, there just wasn't a lot of like access. Um, additionally, the law firm lifestyle is everything you see it is on TV. <laughs> it's working crazy hours. It's being at the beck and call of the partners at all times. Um, and for me at that point, I had two little kids, you know, I had a, um, you know, a four, it, I'd been there for about three years as an attorney. So seven years total. So I had a four-year-old and a one-year-old and it was just not, the lifestyle really wasn't that great for me. So I started looking at opportunities at companies and what's that, what that is called, it's called like, called going in house. So looking at being a corporate attorney, um, had a couple of different opportunities. Uh, and the one that resonated the best with me was here in, in Metro DC at uh, AstraZeneca Metamune, which is now just AstraZeneca. And so, you know, landed here, um, been here for about seven and a half years. Uh, it's been like, I'm really enjoying doing all the interesting things in the house and I'll go, I'll dig into those a little later. But, um, you know, that was, that was sort of my crazy path to getting becoming a patent attorney. It was, I don't want to say all of it was accidental, but it was just kind of like every time I got to a point where I didn't know what I was going to do, I, you know, I made a decision based on what is the most interesting thing to do scientifically. Right. And so I know it's difficult being in grad school sometimes where, you know, everyone you're interacting with is in academia. So for them, the most scientific, interesting thing scientifically is to stay in academia. Uh, and that may not be the right call for everyone. And to be honest, of all of my friends, um, you know, I probably have 10 really good friends who graduated all together and uh, none of them are in academia currently. So, and they're all having very successful careers working either at companies um, or, you know, working um, as, uh, you know, adjunct professors or, you know, none of them are doing like real academic research. Um, I have another friend who's also a patent attorney, one of my best friends from school. So, you know, there's a lot, a lot of that can be gained from the skills you learn in graduate school, critical thinking, um, analysis, like all of those things are very important to any career you would have. And they're super important to law. Um, so moving on. Uh, anyway, I'll pause. Do you have any questions at all before I move on to the next part, just about my career path or anything? Shout them out. We can practice like law school. I can just cold call people or no, I'm just kidding. We'll do that. I have a question. Yeah. Um, when you were working at the firm and maybe still in your AstraZeneca, did you do mostly prosecution or litigation? So I did a little bit of both. Um, I did, you know, as a patent agent, obviously you, you can only do prosecution. So by the time I graduated from law school, I had a pretty big docket, which means like a list of cases that I'm working on. And I was managing um, two or three clients actually on my own. So a lot of the work I was doing was maintaining the patent portfolios for those folks. Um, towards the end of my time at MBHB, I did get involved in a couple of litigations. Um, I've done more litigation in-house um, because the way we're staffed is that we, um, I have responsibility for a variety of programs, of pipeline programs. And so essentially if your drug is in litigation, you're involved, right? And so one of the main drugs I have um, is in FIMSI, which is our uh, non-small lung cancer and um, small cell lung cancer drug have approved globally. And so there have been a couple of litigations for that in addition to the prosecution. So I've done a little bit of both in that space. So um, yeah, generally, like if you have a PhD or any sort of grad degree, you're going to probably do more prosecution because you can understand the material, you can speak the language of the inventors, which is super important. Um, and so you're going to be doing more of that type of work. Um, but you can definitely dip your toe into litigation as well. Uh, and it's good to have both skill sets. I'm not sure if you're gonna cover this later, but yeah. how was your 
the process to get your first job because when you left North Northwestern, you said you talked with a friend in a mm -hmm. bar or something mm -hmm. and yeah. then you applied to that to that company. But I think that was the short version of it. That was the short version. That was the short version. So so for me, it was really about like figuring out, OK, what do I like to do? Who do I know that's doing that? And how do I get started getting information on that? So I had a couple of my good friends that had gone to business school at University of Chicago. And um, so I, and my brother works at Accenture. Um, he still works there, interestingly. Uh, and so I, you know, I talked to folks in, in consulting and said, hey, you know, if I'm interested in this, you know, what would be an option? So then I just applying for jobs, interviewed with Deloitte McKinsey, BCG. Um, and, you know, I, for me, again, it just wasn't the right fit. Um, I had a couple opportunities that I didn't follow after. Uh, and then in terms of law, the conversation I had with my friend Michelle was, you know, she was at a patent agency said, you should think about this. And so I started just getting online, looking at law firms that were hiring technical specialists, um, you know, ended up applying to several different firms, um, land, ended up landing at MBHB where she was, but, uh, you know, I did apply other, other places as well. So I think it's a little easier now. I feel like there are more opportunities in terms of um, knowledge uh, around, um, you know, opportunities outside of academia. And so, but I definitely think you have to, uh, PhD programs are not designed to get you a job at the end, right? That's the sort of the one fault about this, like law school, you have on-campus interviews and you, it's all set up for you to get summer internships and everything, med school, you match and you go to your research internship or you do all, it's like at the end, you get a job. At the end of grad school, you get more school or a postdoc and writing grants. And it's just not built. It was always built for someone to academia and that's just not feasible for everybody. So, um, you know, it's really about putting yourself out there and doing as much research as possible and making as many contacts as possible. I sent out a lot of requests for informational interviews with people, right? People that I knew or friends of friends or people I saw on LinkedIn or whatever, like don't be shy about doing stuff because we've all been in that boat. So I think it's super important to, to make those inroads early. I mean, don't start, don't start when you're writing, you know, start before then. Um, Cause you know, then you can have opportunities to try, try other things. Uh, so there is a question from Shamara. She says, what additional academic preparation was required when you're applying for law school? Good question. So that, so in order to get into law school, you have to take the LSAT. Um, so I took um, LSAT prep course, um, studied quite a bit, but I didn't, you don't need any sort of like special classes. That's, I mean, you can go to law school with any degree. So for me, it was just about, um, you know, studying for the LSAT and then taking that test. Uh, unfortunately, the LSAT, um, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. That's up, Jerry. Good. That's good. Because the LSAT is rigged. <laughs> it's not, it's not, uh, it's really not a test about knowing anything. It's a test about your ability to take the test. So, um, you know, as long as you, and, it, and honestly, if you come in with a PhD, like you're going to be in a different bucket of applicants. Like the law, the LSAT score is more like just do okay. Um, you know, unless you're trying to go to like an Ivy League or something. Um, for most top tier law schools, you go to like a top 50 school. If you have a PhD, like if you do decently on the LSAT, you'll be fine. Um, but I would say like, if you intend to do it, like definitely take the time to prep for it. Um, there's one thing that law school has taught me. It's prep for tests, LSAT, patent bar, bar exam, like it's constant. But, um, you know, taking review classes and spending the time on those, preparing for those exams is important. All right, I'll move on. It's to work. Oh, one more question. Yep, no problem. You're welcome. All right, let's get this to work. There we go. Yeah. All right. So who can tell me what a patent is? Who knows what a patent is? Anyone? No one knows what a patent is? All right, so a patent is something that gives you, yep, go ahead. No, I was just saying I know what a patent is, but it, it's kind of unfair, I'm in law school right now. Oh, there you go. Well, go ahead, tell, tell the group, tell the group what a patent is. So it's, a, technically it's a piece of paper where you write down or you mark 
someone's intellectual property with your words. It's not like someone can go to a land and measure it with a tape. So you have to use your words to define someone's IP in a piece of paper. And that's mm -hmm. basically what it is. Yeah, that's basically what it is, right? It's um, it's a document that is that describes your invention, and it's you know there's patents all you know every country has its own patent office, every country has its own patent law. So if you want to get a patent, you have to go through all the countries to do that. And what it is, it gives you a right to exclude, right? So a patent actually doesn't give you ownership of anything. It gives you the right to stop other people. From practicing your invention so we think of it as a sword and a shield right so you know we've got uh you've got the house lannister over here uh represented on the shield and the sword so as a sword that means if you have a patent that has ip that dominates someone else's ip so let's say you have a method of blocking cancer or a method of treating cancer by blocking pdl1 mediated expression right and someone else then has an antibody that does that. If you don't have a patent for that exact antibody, but you have a patent for the method, you can assert your patent against someone. So that's your sword, right? You can say, hey, stop doing this. I have a patent, you need to stop. The shield is when you have a patent, let's say you have an antibody against PDL1, and another company wants to make that exact antibody against PDL1, they can't you're now protected because you have a patent that covers that. You have the right to assert against that other group of people. Um, so sword and the shield. So remember that when we think about patents, um, a little more detail. So what, what does a patent give you? Um, a patent gives you the right to exclude others. It's called the limited monopoly, which means you file your patent application. It starts being examined. 20 years from that day is when you lose the right to assert your rights against someone else. It's not forever, things go off patent. But as I was saying before, no patent actually confers any sort of ownership rights. So every people say, oh, I have the patent on that, I own that. Well, not really, right? It's just, it's just you can block someone from using your claim to invention. But as I said, if someone else has dominating IP, so someone else has a patent that, you know, is basically a genus that covers your species, then that right means nothing, right? So in part of our role as a patent attorney, we have to assess something called freedom to operate. You know, do I have freedom in this space? If my research team comes to me and says, I wanna make, you know, a bispecific antibody tar targeting, you know, these two receptors, I need to go into the art and say, okay, what patents out there are ones that could dominate us doing that? Are there broad patents out there? Are there specific antibody sequences or structures that we need to avoid? Um, you know, do we have to approach these companies about getting a license to those rights? Uh, Cause that happens a lot too in industry, right? It's, you know, almost every biologic drug in the market has something called a royalty stack. That means that there's some IP out there that's semi dominating. So we have to pay company X, you know, a 3% royalty on any commercial sales we have because they have this patent. And then once that patent expires, the royalty goes away. But a lot of the analysis we do in that space is figuring out, do we have freedom to operate? Um, and so those risks can be injunctions, which means, you know, I patent holder can go to you company X and say, stop doing what you're doing. That's an injunction. Uh, a royalty is I'll let you do it, but you have to pay me a license fee. Um, and then uh, nuisance lawsuits. I don't know if you've heard of the term patent troll, right? That will be where companies go around and buy old patents um, that are maybe not being used and then they assert them on companies. This happens a lot in the tech space, actually. It doesn't happen very much in the biologic space or the biological sciences space, but in the tech space, you see this a lot, right? Where you have patent trolls. And so we have to figure out, are we at risk of being um, you know, uh, assaulted by a patent troll, right? Um, or we call them NPEs, non-practicing entity. That's the politically correct say, but we call them patent trolls. Um, and then finally, as you start to look through patent applications and uh, in the patent world, a lot of times I'll have my scientists send me something and they're like, hey, we found this patent that totally covers what we're doing. And I go back to them and say, well, this actually is a patent. It's a patent application, right? So patent applications, when they publish, tend to be very broad and claim everything in the world, knowing full that they're never going to get that granted when it actually goes through examination. And I'll talk a little bit about that later in the talk, but there's a process to get a patent. And the thing you start with is never what you finish with. So a public a published patent application is not servable rights. Um, you know, it does put your 
your flag in the sand in terms of this is the kind of thing that I'm going after to get a patent on, but it, they're not, they don't have any power. So granted claims are going to be much narrower than the published application. Um, and, you know, uh, a published application doesn't give you any, any power. All right, so typical patent timeline. When you file a patent application, um, after you get everything, essentially a patent application is just a manuscript plus claims. So in an ideal situation, I work with my scientists and if we're late enough in the project, we'll say, hey, you know, I know you guys are working on a manuscript. When that's done, give it to me. I will turn that manuscript into a patent application. I will draft claims for that and then we'll file it. So that's, your, that's called your priority application. That's called, it's a lot of times it's like a provisional. That application is not examined, right? It's just something to set your date. I have this date. And so anything that comes after me um, you know, it cannot be used against me. Uh, and so that happens. And a year later, it moves to what's called a national uh, a PCT filing or a national stage filing. Um, and that that's the one that gets examined. Um, 18 months later, your patent application will publish. So in the world of biotech, you know, we, we want to do our best to keep things secret. So a lot of conversations I have with our scientists are, okay, if we file this, like know that in 18 months, the whole world is going to know about this. And so we think about timing. Does it make sense to go after it at this point? Do we want to wait? Um, you know, do we want to have this align with like a me major meeting like ASCO or ESMO or AACR or something? And so this thing will publish around the same time that we're presenting the data. So we have a lot of discussions about that timing wise. Uh, after 30 months is what's called the national phase entry. So um, you can file in each individual patent office. Like we said, each country has its own patents. And so if we're gonna sell drugs in those countries, we need to have patent protection. Um, and so depending on what the drug is, it's the number of countries that we go into for small molecules, which tend to be like your pills or inhaled drugs. We tend to have a much bigger filing footprint. We go into probably 60 different countries. Um, but for biologics, uh, we have, there's an issue of cold chain distribution. So not every country can um, reliably administer all of our drugs uh, that are injection or IV. Um, so we have a smaller filing footprint. So let's say it's like 30 countries. Um, and so at this 30 month date, you pick which countries you wanna go into. And there is a, an office called the, the PCT, the Patent Co Cooperation Treaty Office, and you give them the application and then they farm it out to all the different countries for you. So it's got kind of a nice thing. And then, um, yeah, so filed throughout the world. And then, uh, you know, after, if you're lucky, after a few years of prosecution, um, you get your patent. And that pirate patent is going to expire 20 years from the day it's filed. So quite often, um, you know, a patent that is filed, you know, maybe seven or eight years before, a patent will be filed seven or eight years before the drug even hits the market. And so we have to start thinking about, you know, does it make sense? What do we think commercial projections will be? Do we think this is a viable drug? pretty early on. So there's a lot of crystal ball gazing and a lot of working with the strategy teams at the company to figure out, does this make sense? And that's one of the reasons I, I like being in house is because you really are a hundred percent in on the, the strategy and the development. So I sit on multiple research committees. I'm in research meetings all the time. Like 70% of my day is talking about science and not about law, which is great. Um, so so that, that's one of the good things about it. All right, uh, before I jump into basics of patent law, does anyone have any questions? Yes, there's one. All right, what is your advice on graduate students that think of patentable inventions? Is it better to wait till after graduating independently or file through the university? Good question. All right, so I guess the question would be, or the answer to that would be, where did you come up with this? Did you use university materials? Did you do it in the lab while you were there? If you did, then the university owns it, unfortunately, I hate to bring it to you. Um, you have to go to the tech transfer office and, and work with them and you'll be an inventor, but the university owns anything you do in grad school. Uh, if you did it on your own and you didn't use university um, you know, uh, facilities or materials, then, you know, then maybe you may wanna think about filing it on your own or getting a patent attorney to file a provisional for you, and then thinking about, uh, you know, moving forward and, and, and spinning it forward into some sort of opportunity, whether it's to start your own thing or to license it out, 
But uh, unfortunately, in the agreement you signed when you started there, uh, the university will own anything you do. So, that. Yep, no problem. All right, so I'm going to zip through this real quick because I don't want to spend too much time on this, but there's always, you know, in order to get a patent, you have to go through a certain, a bunch of different levels of examination. Um, the first thing is whether your subject matter is patentable or not. In the U.S., this is USC 101. So you can't patent the sun. You can't patent math. You can't patent a leaf off of a tree, but you can patent a drug that you use to, you know, that you pull some sort of chemical out of the leaf and you make a, a drug and treat someone that's patentable. Um, using solar power to drive something, um, or you could, you're making a solar cell that utilizes solar, you know, that uses the sun, that's patentable, but nature is not patentable. So that's always the first step is, is this nature? The second piece, sorry, my computer is being goofy. The second piece is, is it novel? Did is somebody else have the exact same thing out there? Um, and that's, you know, this, are you copying someone? Um, so that's the second step. Did you copy someone or is this something that's truly new? The third piece is not obviousness, which is a little complicated, but essentially it means that would somebody of skill in the art or so meaning like would another PhD scientist think of this exact thing based on what's in the art, right? So I always make the example of like, if somebody patents a right-handed pen, um, you probably can't get a patent on a left-handed pen because it's an obvious iteration of that thing. So that, that to me is like where a lot of the fights are in patent law is around obviousness is like, is this a real invention or did you just tweak it in a way that anyone would do and you happen to do it first, All right? And so a lot of times we deal with non-obviousness um, and that's probably the most complex concept. Uh, the last one is has to do with the disclosure in the patent application itself. So um, it's written description and enablement. So I always say that, uh, you know, written description is basically the ingredients so if you're going to cook something, like you have to list out all the ingredients and what needs to go into the stew. Um, and enablement is how you cook it. What are the cooking temperatures? How long do you stir it for? All that stuff. That has to be in the patent application sufficiently such that one of skill in the art would see it, be able to make it, cook it, and have it taste good, right? So that's, that's sort of like how you think about patent law. These four things, you check all those boxes, you get a patent. So what can be patented from a biotech perspective? So here we have basically the life cycle of a drug, right? You know, a lot of all these biologics we're making in, in um, sorry, all these biologics we're making in cells. Um, we've got DNA, we've got plasmids, cell banks, protein production, um, how do you purify the protein, fill finish, formulations, every single step along the way we file patent applications for. So if you have a drug, like one of my drugs, I probably have, there's, I probably have 16 different patents on it. Um, from methods of treatment to, to manufacturing, to all sorts of things. So in the biotech world, we're always looking to capture innovation that's happening at the company. And so there's innovation happening at every step. So how do we build a patent portfolio? Um, the first thing you're gonna file on in the biologics world is the protein sequence. So that's gonna be your antibody sequence, what it binds to, um, you know, what, what the epitopes are, all that stuff that's gonna be your first sort of level of protection. <laughs> Second, um, if you have any sort of like interesting protein structure, so let's say you come up with a novel protein format, some sort of a bispecific format that's maybe tethered using, you know, a specific disulfide bridge or whatever, you could build a platform around that. So that protein structure itself would be patentable. Um, another thing you can do is a method of treatment. So if you have a drug that drives a specific biological mechanism, you can cover use of that drug to drive said mechanism, right? So if you wanna have a drug, for example, we have a drug that's used in combination with radiation therapy. We did all those studies in mice. We drove a specific CD8, CD8 positive T cell effect. If you do that, that's patentable. Um, another thing that's patentable uh, would be clinical dose. So once we go into the clinic, we spend a lot of time trying to figure out how do you dose this? How much drug do you give to the patient? How frequently do you give it? What kind of mechanisms are you get? What kind of biological mechanisms are you driving from a, you know, a, a kinetic perspective? Um, all of those concepts and how you give the drug, that's also patentable. So if I give a drug to a patient every two weeks at this particular milligrams per kilogram, that piece 
is patentable. Um, finally, formulation. Um, to formulate a drug, you don't just take a protein and stick it into a person, right? You have to have it certain excipients and it needs to be shelf stable. Um, there's all these things you need to do to get it to last and also stay in the right formation when it goes into the body. That's patentable. And then methods of manufacturing. Um, manufacturing biologics is super complex, right? Because you're looking at 10,000 liter bioreactors, um, massive scale up, um, tons of different, um, you know, purification methods, all these things. So that every, for every single drug we make, we have to basically do a whole new manufacturing campaign. And so we come up with a lot of interesting things in that space. So all the things in that manufacturing process are patentable as well. All right, so how do we think about a patent portfolio? Well, we think of it in layers of exclusivity. So your internal layers or composition, um, and then on your composition, you can get things called where you can extend. So patent term extension um, comes when you are in the clinic and because you're in the clinic, you're not able to sell your drug, right? The FDA says you need to be in the clinic for three phases and we're gonna go ahead and make you do this for five years, et cetera. And so they give you some of that time back um, because as I said, you file your patent application pretty early. So every day you're in the clinic, you're burning patent term. Um, so you get some of that time back uh, based on the, how long you were in the clinic. And then another piece is called regulatory data protection. So in the US, Japan, and in Europe, um, once your drug is approved, you get protection from, from a generic just per se. So even if you don't have a patent in the US, 12 years, in Europe, 10 years, and in Japan, nine years, you can sell your drug without any sort of competition, even if you don't have a patent. So that's another layer of exclusivity. And then the outer layers are the things we talked about, right? With manufacturing, drug delivery, new indications, all that kind of stuff, right? So. So as a patent attorney, you know, our number one job is to try to build these layers, to build these concentric circles, you know, um, moats around the castle of the, uh, the composition of matter. And so because of that, we're interacting with folks all over the company. Um, folks in bi uh, biologic process development are the manufacturing folks, the formulation folks, the clinical folks, R&D people, um, you know, our regulatory folks. So being a patent attorney, actually is one of the few functions at the company where you interact with everybody in the company, um, which I think is great because I get exposure to a lot of cool things from the commercial sales force, from our strategy teams. Um, so I'm never bored. Uh, it's not, I, that's the one thing about being in-house versus being at a firm is that I'm not just sitting there cranking out patent applications, which is fine. Um, but I think, you know, maybe one third of my day is actually doing patent stuff. The rest is all strategy and research and development stuff, which is awesome. Um, so just kind of getting into what else I do. Um, in addition to doing all this stuff, I sit in a couple different leadership teams um, in oncology. So I do, I'm the lead attorney for immuno oncology and cell therapy. Uh, so, you know, looking at um, ideas for bringing in different mechanisms of treating things. Can we have new platforms? Um, thinking about what kind of talent we want to bring in to, to run these things. Um, also, um, you know, getting involved in the strategy. Like, so I'm, I'm right now I'm doing a, a build with the commercial team to move one of our drugs from IV infusion to subcutaneous injection. So just getting involved in the strategy there and do we need to go look for partnerships, et cetera. Um, I also do a lot of work with our business development team on deals. Um, so I would say at, at all times, I'm usually on at least a couple deals. Um, so we're, whether we're out licensing molecules that we no longer want or we're in licensing molecules from other companies or we're trying to do partnerships where it's our drug plus their drug in the clinical trial. Um, we just recently bought Alexion, which is another company in Boston. Um, so we had, you know, for every kind of deal like that, we've got attorney staffed on that. Um, our legal group, uh, so we have about 75,000 employees globally, and we have about 120 attorneys globally. Um, and they're all in different tech areas, patents, um, corporate, um, and then we have our two litigation teams that cover oncology and biopharm, which is basically everything but oncology. Um, but we work cross-functionally. So I do a lot of work with the oncology litigation team. I do a lot of work with the corporate team. So you get exposure to other types of law being in-house, which I think is great. Um, you know, I would say like I'm as proficient at licensing now as I am at patent law just by doing the work. Um, so that's been great. It's been a great thing for me. Um, I love the job. Uh, definitely, you know, we'll do this for the rest of my career. 
And that is it for my talk. So that's my family. Uh, we do a lot of traveling. So this is back in the olden days when you could travel. Uh, this was us in Germany a couple summers ago. So I guess I'll open it up to questions. Thanks a lot. In us. Obviously, all the foreign prosecution we use outside counsel for, um, but we do do a lot of our own U.S. prosecution, and we have attorneys that sit in Europe as well in our group, patent attorneys, so they do the European prosecution. Um, these days, because I have more of a, a su supervisory role and a strategic, strategic role, um, a lot of my prosecution I use outside counsel for, but it's sort of a mix. I mean, I think there's a couple, I have a couple portfolios that I keep um, just because they're kind of important and I'd rather just work on them myself. Um, but there's a good balance, I think, between outside counsel and um, doing it in-house. I think there's a lot of companies that only use outside counsel. Like, I don't think we'd ever go to that model just because I do think it's important to stay sharp and understand what's happening and, and not lose that skill set. Um, but in the end, you just don't have a lot of time to do it. Prosecution takes a long time. Um, we don't do any of our own patent drafting. We send that all to outside counsel. But, um, you know, it's easier for me to review work that outside counsel has done and then you know, use my time to in the strategy space uh, to help the company. Um, I think that maybe you know, with a law school, with the law school right there, um, it's it's worth like just contacting the people who teach patent law, contact the practitioners there, um, contact folks that are you know, willing to, uh, to maybe have a conversation with you. I think there's also a lot of really good blogs to read on patent law. Um, patent Docs is one that's a good biotech patent law blog. There's Patent Leo. Um, you know, there's all sorts of things just to kind of learn about what patent law is uh, and get a sense for that. But, you know, in the end, it's just about like, if you have, if you have questions, you can talk, contact me. I mean, there's plenty of, it's just about having conversations with people and trying to figure out you know, if you think you would like it, I mean, in the end, you're not going to know until you do it. Um, but, but it is definitely a career choice that I think a lot of people would like. I will tell you, if you don't like writing, you shouldn't do it <laughs> because it's, I always joke that I'm, I'm a professional typist, you know, I'm a professional writer at this point. Um, cause most of law is not, uh, law and order. Like we're not, you know, 90% of lawyers never set foot in a courtroom. Um, it's a lot of written communication verbal negotiation, you really become an excellent writer. And I think the skills I learned in grad school, you know, having to write, having to write manuscripts, having to do PowerPoint presentations, having to, you know, explain science to other scientists, having to explain science to, you know, my non-science family, like all those things, I think prep me for being a good attorney because you have to be able to communicate written and verbal. So if you don't like doing those things, then, you know, maybe not patent law, but, but I think if you can get over that and you can become excellent at that skill, it's gonna be beneficial. Look, luckily, there are a lot of good search engines, patent specific search engines. So I can put in keywords, I can use something called Genome Quest to do sequence searching. I can use Blast for sequence searching. Um, kind of like any tool that you use in the lab to look up sequences, like it's the same thing. Um, but then after that, you start to dig into the patent space with keywords, um, looking in claims, looking in abstracts of the uh, of the patent. And then it gives you a sense of who the players are, like what companies are in that space. And then it, it actually gets, you know, you get better at narrowing things down. So once you've done, you know, obviously I've been doing these kind of searches now for 15 years, right? So I sort of know when I see things, if they're relevant or not, but as you do it over time, it gets easier, but there are a lot of good search engines. The USPTO has a good search engine. Um, there's companies that do this. So it's really, it's a lot easier now, I think, than it was maybe 10 years ago. Um, to find what we call prior art. So what's out out there in the patent space. Patents. If someone, yeah, so that would be definitely cited against you, right? So if someone says, hey, it'd be really cool if we could do it this way, and then you go and do it that way, like the examiner will certainly say, hmm, this is probably obvious. But if you have differentiating data, if you have something to say like, look, yes, we get that they threw it out there. But this is not an enabling disclosure, right? Essentially, they've given you the ingredients, but they haven't told you how to cook anything. So you'd make the argument that says, hey, this is not obvious because we show that it does X. No one would have thought that. We've shown that we combined it this way. No one would have thought that. We've created something where there was an unmet need, right? We put that into the space. So there's all sorts of ways to argue around obviousness. And so what, what I always like to tell our inventors is the more data, the better, right? So that I can say, hey, look, I'm glad that they thought this was a cool idea. I actually did it. 
And here's all the proof of that. And so that's how you get over obviousness. Data is always gonna get you over obviousness because an idea is not an invention, right? There's something called reduction to practice. So you have to have an idea and then you have to show that it works. And if you don't do both, it's not an invention. So if you reduce it to practice in a way that was not thought of before, you're likely gonna get a patent. If I could go to law school full-time, I would have, right? But I had a family and I really thought that continuing to work was gonna be better for my career. And in the end it was, because I was all that time in law school I was getting really good at patent law. That's three and a half years of like doing patent law, right? So if you go straight after undergrad and go to law school, like, like, yeah, you know law, but to be honest, like you don't know how to be a lawyer until you're a lawyer. You don't want to be a patent attorney until you're like, so, you know, everything that I learned about being a good attorney, I learned working, not in law school, right? So if you can make it work, if you can handle the, I mean, cause it's not fun. I'm not going to lie. Like going to work at 8.30 and then going to class at 5.30 and getting home at 10 is not fun. But, you know, after a while you get used to it and, and there are benefits to having a salary and, you know, and if you have a PhD, more than likely you'll get some financial compensation. You'll get some scholarship money. You know, it's good. And there are a lot of really good night programs in there. Cause there are a lot of people that go to law school and business school at night. It doesn't have to be a full-time thing. Um, I went in the summer as well, and it was only like, it was basically like May to 4th of July, and I cut off a whole semester just by going in the summer, right? So I was there for three and a half years. My last semester was a joke. I didn't really work that hard, <laughs> right? So after the first year, you can kind of put it in cruise control a little bit. You figure out how you study, um, how the tests work, how much work you need to do, all that stuff. Uh, so so yeah, I think I think for me, I think the night school option is good. If you're working at a firm already, stay at that firm. That's the way to do it. I think that you don't need the PhD. Like there are people on our team, senior attorneys on our team that are awesome biologics attorneys and have master's degrees, right? I think the difference will be that you're going to have to probably pick up a lot on the job, which is fine. Like that's okay too, right? I mean, it's whatever, if you understand science, um, and you understand how to, in the end, if you can have a conversation with another scientist, that's the key, right? Do you understand what they're talking about? Can you look at data and be like, ah, this is Fugazi. Like, I don't believe this, right? Do you have, do you know, like what that looks like? Do you know how to plan experiments? Do you understand if you can do all that stuff? Like you don't need necessarily a PhD, right? I mean, the PhD gives you that, but you know, you could argue that people have PhDs that still aren't good at that, right? So it doesn't, it doesn't matter necessarily. And I think given the experience you have, and you're doing, you're doing it now. Um, I wouldn't be that concerned with it. I think that, you know, you just have to get your foot in the door for a job. And at that point, no one cares what your resume is, to be honest. After your, here's another secret for those of you out there. After your first job, none of this matters. <laughs> like, it doesn't matter where you went to school. It doesn't matter what your GPA was. It doesn't, none of it matters after you get your first job. That is just, do you know what you're doing? Are you good at it? And that's it. So. I'm in total control of my time. So like if I have to do something with my kids or I want to take a day off or I have to go to the dentist or whatever, you just do it. Like we're totally flexible in that way. Um, and then if I want to come home at six or five or whatever, and I want to shut it down and shut it down. Right. Or if I want to work in the evening, there's no client be, to be holding to. There's no like partner looking over my shoulder like that. None of that is like that. It's very much a you know, just get your work done environment. Now there's a lot of work to be done and I work most evenings, but you know, that's like, you know, with my laptop on watching an NBA game, it's not like sitting at my desk and like grinding. So it's different. Um, that being said, there are certain times where like, I would say that the stress level at a firm is always about a seven, right? Whereas at in-house it's like four and then it's an 11 and it's an 11 indefinitely. And it's till this fire is out. Like, you know, I was on a deal last year where we were bringing in, it was a pretty big deal, bringing in multiple molecules with a company in France. And for like about a month straight, I was on calls at 6 a.m. on Saturday, 6 a.m. on Sunday, like, because we'd send them back a draft. They would do it. Time change. We're back on. It's noon for them. It's 7, 6 a.m. for us. I should have just gone to Paris. I don't know why I stayed home, right? It would have been easier. Um, next time I'm just going to go. But, you know, those kind of things, like, you're going to have some of those like, and it's going to be bad. But for the most part, 
you just, it's a very, at least our company is very family friendly and uh, everyone understands that they have other lives and things going on. And also when you're on vacation, people leave you alone. Like doesn't happen in the firm. Like literally I'm like, I'm gone for two weeks. Don't talk to me. And no one talks to you. It's great. Like, so uh, that, that's that been a plus. And so I definitely think, and, and all my other friends that are in-house at other companies feel the same way. It's just sort of a, I think we all coming from the law firm, we all wouldn't put up with not having work-life balance. So I think it's just part of the culture.